So oh, no. I'll, I'll make sure you're fine. <laughs> uh, so, so chris let, let, let's just still out of lockdown is it there's no more be no more developments so, i think we're i think we're okay i think we're okay so i was just looking for a photo i found a photo of steve because steve, steve told me um that when he goes running it's a little bit different to me because steve's got to be careful that he's not followed by bears or cougars and and i actually found a i actually found a, a photo it was sent to me as a birthday card actually of, of steve um, out cycling, look. Oh, <laughs> it's moved. <laughs> it's moved. <laughs> oh well. Oh, oh gosh. Yeah. So the, the the story behind that is, uh, uh, Chris, as you know, I'm a I'm a road cyclist, uh, and I actually just bought a motorbike um, for adventure riding. But uh, I I did a climb uh, recently up on a place called Mount Palomar, which is uh, the uh, Alpe d'Huez of uh, Southern California, the famous. Uh, road race for the, in the Tour de France, but it's a very winding road mountain. And uh, I climbed that uh, earlier this summer on a very, very hot day. Uh, I, I think I was exhausted for a week after. Right. Wow. <laughs> so, oh, well, so I've cheated recently, I bought an electric bike. So, although I still have to pedal quite a bit, I can go twice as fast because it happens to be unregulated as well, which is a bit of a blessing. Um, but also, uh, when you go up steep holes, it does make life uh, really easily. But anyway, on that very exciting note, um, we are officially live now. It's five o'clock. So um, uh, five o'clock, that is British summertime. It is uh, nine o'clock in the sun where you are. Is it uh, nine o'clock in the West Coast? It just turned 9 a.m. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. So welcome, uh, Stephen. Um, oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for hosting here. I appreciate it. <laughs> no, our absolute pleasure. Um, I'll just do a little bit of a quick intro, and then obviously we'll hand over to you and Chris in a moment, if I can just bring this up. Wait a second. Um, yes, yeah, so this is this topic that Stephen is going to talk about. I love the title just by itself, so I'm really looking forward to this, uh, this, uh, this show, as it were. And uh, just trying to find my mouse again, just give me a second. Um, now, obviously, some of you have taken the trouble to introduce yourselves already. So do put your, so, put what you do in the chat. That'd be lovely. Uh, what you're really passionate about, uh, that'd be really fantastic. Because uh, I think you will find you get a lot more out of that if you're also share, able to share a little bit about your why and what you're passionate about as well. It's what Steve's going to be talking about today. If you've got a killer question for Steve, uh, then... Uh, don't necessarily wait till the crucial point. Just drop those in as you think of them, and we will try and feed those in as best as we can. A little bit of an introduction into myself. Um, I founded Business Growth Bureau about six and a half years ago. Um, fundamentally believe in the importance of circular relationships where all the relevant parties win out of it. It is about trying to think of people who you can help and support them and what they're doing and make them feel good about the relationship. And guess what? It, things seem to come back in droves or as fades, as a good old British saying would go. And uh, Chris, you probably want to introduce a little bit about yourself, don't you? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah. My name is Chris Cooper, and uh, I, I work with leaders to help them to elevate their performance, their um, teams, and also build highly engaged workforces. It's at the ninth uh, year as well of the Business Elevation Show on, on Voice America, which, I, which I've hosted we weekly. Uh, and I'm the... Um, co-author of the power to get things whether you, done whether you feel like it or not and I was with um I was with a, a client on Tuesday who I've been I'm doing a really very multifaceted sort of program with them to elevate their performance as as people and the the owner of the business uh, walked into the room I was doing coaching three leaders this week and and he said to me and he's not one he's a lovely man and he's not one to give compliments uh, easily but he, he just said he said Chris he said um just chatting with our HR director and she said we haven't got any people and he said I, said, I haven't got any people worries um, anything on my mind for the last two months um is this how it how it's supposed to be and uh, I said well actually yeah if we, we put a business into flow and we take the shark edges off and we all kind of work together and we we build engagement this is this is what happens and that's what so that's what I do I realize that's what I do I help build you know, I think organizations where people work beautifully together. So I think, which leads me very nicely on to Stephen Morris, really, because uh, we, we, how long have we known each other, Stephen? Five years? Oh, uh, yeah, it, 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 uh, I would say at least four. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. And we met through our dear friend, uh, Libby Wagner. Yeah, we met through Libby Wagner, who's a wonderful leadership uh, expert and, 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 and poet. And, uh, and Steve, Steve, I don't know, um, it's like just introducing you, you know, you've always come across to me, we, we, we hit it off when we first met. And, you know, we have this, uh, this connection, even though we've never met sort of physically, but I think the things I, I love about Steve is he's always very calm and centered and he's, he's very wise. He's, he's got a wonderful marketing kind of background. And uh, besides being an author of uh, some, some amazing books, you've, you've written writing a book at the moment about the beautiful business. And I think that really, you know, connects. And I think your, your, your life's quite interesting. Tell us a little bit about your, your life because you surf and all those kind of things as well. You, you seem to have a very a life that's really well in, in balance and harmony. Yeah, I, um, I, I think it, perhaps uh, my, if my wife were, she would say that I get bored easily uh, and uh, love uh, pushing the boundaries of adventure and perform. I'm constantly learning new things. And so, um, you know, the integration of my background comes from uh, both a fine arts background, uh, studies in which I studied in undergraduate school, uh, as well as fine art, and then a master's degree in design, and then came up through the industry uh, in the agency world as what we call a creative. Uh, but I've, I've been painting for the better part of 30 years, and I show in galleries uh, across the country and across the world. Uh, one of the paintings that you'll see is uh, uh, mine is right behind me. But I also get into some weird stuff. Uh, I'm a beekeeper, um, uh, you know, a surfer for a long, long time, and have surfed in far off places such as the North Shore of Hawaii, which we we are over there. And I get, you know, when I was younger, I got involved in some very big and scary situations over there and stuff that it was out of my element. And the other things I get into is trail running and road cycling. And uh, part of my past is as a triathlete and uh, I, you know, beekeeping. And now my, my latest uh, sort of endeavor is uh, motorcycle riding. And uh, I have bike that I'm just getting used to and trying not to crash on. So uh, <laughs> that's the sort of side of my world. And, uh, you know, from a professional standpoint, uh, I, I built and sold an agency three years ago. I founded that agency in 1994. And then you're really what I do now is work as a consultant in brand strategy and culture strategy and really evolving organizations. And we can talk in more detail about that. Thanks. I'm just looking at uh, Nikki, Nikki Wilds uh, just sort of identified that she's passionate about turning or uh, de-stressing directors. And one of the things I always find about you, you, Stephen, is, uh, is that uh, I, I've, I find a conversation with you. I'm, uh, I'm de-stressed after it. It's, there's a, a calmness and a centeredness to you that I find quite intriguing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's probably my, my spiritual Zen practices coming into play and try to fuse that, uh, but not oversell that. You know, uh, people, I think we pick up on one another's energy and that energy that we pick up on can be contagious and that can be contagious both when we're really stressed out. You know, in, somebody walks into a room, they're really stressed out, you can act that. But the other side of that happens when calmness enters the room and uh, I think you know people can feed off of that particular energy as well. Mm. And, and you, 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 you have discipline to do that, don't you? To do that, don't you? Got a bit of echo. I do. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, uh, you know, for the past I don't know 10, 10 or more years, uh, I've have a daily med med meditation twice a day, uh, meditation practice morning and evening. And uh, I was trained by Deepak Chopra in some of his primordial sound meditation. I work with some other folks in that particular world. But I also get into self-reflecting reflection through journaling after I meditate every day. And a lot of that self-reflection is capturing some of the insights uh, and things that I'm thinking about that has to do with the, the holistic elements of my life, not necessarily just work. So it's not like I come out of meditation and make a to-do list for today. Uh, I come out of meditation and reflect on where I am and where my where my spirit is is lying and how centered I feel and maybe the things that I want to give myself some attention to uh, in that particular given day. And Kristen, yeah. you and I have done some really interesting back and forth journaling practices yeah. where you know we've acted as account of buddies in that particular realm, which has been a lot of fun. 
We have, yeah. I think just thinking now, it's time time to start that again. Get me um I think so, yeah. back on track because I've just I've just got just diverted off track and need to pull back to center again. Yeah, yeah. So we, we um so we're going to talk about you know obviously about a beautiful business and why why is why is a beautiful business and this sort of concept important to you? Clearly, you're you're an artist who creates beautiful work, and I imagine you you do that with your clients in some in some ways. Um, but where where does this this beautiful uh, element uh, come from for you in your sort of background? Is it something you've been important to you since you were a child? Or yeah, it's you know it's uh, the way I think about it, Chris. It's part of the approach to beauty or the beautiful business from my perspective is it it is both a fusion of what comes from my background and you know just very very high level you know i'm both an artist at at my core a spiritual seeker at my core but i'm also a student of psychology and human behavior and what makes us tick what what, what drives us what motivates us why do we do what we do how why do we live the life that we live and why in in this particular lens why do we do the work that we do and what truly inspires us and so really the fusion behind the beautiful business is less about the way things appear and much more so about the way things are. And so part of the beautiful business or the, the concept of beauty in the business world is a recognition of the word beauty. You know, in Western culture, for the most part, uh, the advertising industry, the fashion industry, the cosmetics industry, have kind of taken and uh, controlled that word to mean something that it's really not intended. And their particular uh, attributes or definitions of beauty has more to do with the physical adornment or the outward uh, physicality of what it can mean. Um, and while that's certainly an attribute, and there's been a lot of studies around that, you know, when I think about the beautiful, it's really going leaning into the Japanese aesthetic principles of beauty, which have to do with the uh, the core attributes of symmetry, harmony, things that are in line with the laws of nature, and therefore things that are whole and have integrity within them, and work within an operating system that comes from the inside out. And so the outside beauty that one might experience is actually a reflection of what's happening inside, not just this physical adornment that happens on the outside. So we see this sometimes in companies and organizations in their brand presentation, where they make this amazing looking brand. But then when you get to understand the, how that company operates, either the way they develop their products or treat their employees or treat their customers, or source their materials from uh, sustainability or environmental you realize it's actually not quite beautiful like just the the outside is beautiful but not the inside and so my intent behind uh, sort of the reclamation and, and the articulation of the beautiful business has to do with let's work in the core first to get clear about what the organization and the leaders of that organization believe and stand for and then let's echo that out to have an integrated system so that the world actually responds to its authentic manner in a way that's true to them. And then they create this attraction, which uh, yeah. I think, you know, part of beauty is, you know, when you find yourself in a moment of awe, like you, you, you could all envision just a moment where you've seen just this gorgeous sunset over the Grand Canyon or the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean or wherever you live, uh, even across yard field as the sun is setting or a moment in the morning where you feel at, at one with nature and connection with nature that's actually beauty coming to life in a moment of awe or in a, in a moment of of feeling one with everything and that one with everything is an integrated system and then now all of a sudden when you feel that you're connected to it so just to give a you know maybe a practical reflection i i was i thought of you yesterday St uh, Stephen, because i was sitting with the managing director of um, everard's brewery and I, i've worked with them for many many years and i spent 18 months of that time uh, maybe a little more working on a new development and and what they've done is they they, they sold their a brewery and their offices and they had 90 acre site uh, which um a, a green site across some um, the road from a busy shopping center. So they sold their land to the shopping center and they built a new um, a new off, set of office, a lovely craft brewery. 
Uh, and then they have 70 acres of uh, land on floodplain, which they which was was private previously, and they've turned it over to the public. So it's now there's a, a beautiful cycling store, which I was was involved in that area and uh, and cycling paths and there's a bridge over a river so people can cycle in and out there's a coffee shop and hundreds of pe local people who were locked in with covid are now enjoying this amazing free space that's everards who at the core of their business which is about about you know tradition with ambition but also kindness uh, and, and not only that, the land is being developed in terms of its biodiversity, there's more trees being planted and various things. And it just feel, I just thought about you and I thought about this idea of beautiful business as I, as we sat together admiring what we really, what we were talking about as, a, as just a vision back in 2004. And I thought, is this, is this what beautiful business is about? Because it feels good. Yeah. I mean, it sounds to me like they've, they've really looked at all the, considerations and attributes that that particular property is connected to and they're integrating the environment the people and how they interact with the environment uh, the sustainability and the usability of that particular uh, system and the facility with, associated with it and there it, it seems to me like they're they're making an invitation to a broad public that says you know, this is here for you. We made this for you. It, it's a sense of service offering that says this is for you and there's value. Come discover what that value is and come have an experience, which is very different than the mindset that says we're going to build this thing and it's a massive brew pub and come down and have a drink and, you know, drop down, a, you know, 100 pounds or, you know, uh, 100 euros a night and, you know, spend whatever the money is and, you know, you'll have a great time. That's, that's a very different than a, a consideration or even, you know, marketing proposition, if you will, than the experience and the invitation for that experience that these folks are, are looking to uh, sort of amplify it to the world. It came very much. Yeah, it came very much from, uh, you know, one generation wanting to leave a legacy. Uh, and uh, I think that's what it what it's done. In fact, I'm interviewing the, the managing directs my my show next next week. Um, and it's it'll be be fascinating. So I'm gonna I might just share that link actually, um, so people can go and and, and access access the um, that that interview uh, and find out more about kindness and lead, leadership. So how do we? I just want to share that as an example, maybe, so people can maybe put put this into context, Steve. So how how do you? Let's talk about sort of brands and marketing and sales and and their relationships and how they link into a beautiful business. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so there's a you know a lot of the work that I do is is considered around brand. It's it's kind of how I came up through the the agency world, and um, you know there's a lot of confusion around what a brand is. Uh, you know, a lot of people think about a brand as the exterior presentation of the company, which would include its logo, its identity, uh, the design attributes, including the website or the marketing materials, and sometimes that makes its way into the product design and things like that. Um, that, in my opinion, is all mainstream attributes or exterior attributes of brand. You know, so the way I define brand, brand is about character. And, uh, you know, I think about business primarily in psychological terms. So uh, if, if we were all to agree that all business is made by humans for humans, and even though we have AI involved in the consideration these days, even AI is replicating the intelligence of the way a human might analyze or think, but all business at the end of the day is by humans and for humans. So if that's true, then the psychological attributes of how we as humans operate in the world should be infused consciously within the business itself. So then we get into a consideration of, well, what are our belief systems? What is it that the leadership team or the core founders of the business actually believe and why are they why are they building the business just making money? Because I'll, you know, just being very provocative here, the world doesn't need yet another company who's just out to make profit, right? The world needs actually businesses who are committed to making change and improving people's lives. So the belief system is 
in, investigated and instilled by the leadership team to define what is it that we believe and what are we trying to do with this in, within this business mm -hmm. and I call that purpose. So the character attributes come from the belief systems which have to do primarily with the values. And so the exterior impression that that character of the organization has is back to that brand. So, you know, a lot of people think about the branding, which is the, you know, the, the cattle marking that marks marks the, the cow that says we own this cow. Well, really brand is about the impression that it leaves. And Maya Angelou has a saying that goes, it's a very famous saying, I'll probably fumble it, but I'm gonna paraphrase it, is that people might forget what you said, people might forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And that's really what brand is all about. And when it comes through in a consistent manner, how you make the people around you, all stakeholders, be they investors, the community, employees or customers, how you make them feel is the impression that you leave. And that's really what a brand is. And do you think, Stephen, that it's easier is it easier for a you know a family-owned business or private business, or you know we have a, a number of people here who are, have their own businesses? Uh, is it easier to create a beautiful business when you don't have lots of uh, shareholders involved who are maybe wanting a return, perhaps? Does, does our yeah. does our does our capitalist system lend itself to a beautiful business, or is is, is it uh, better focused where there's um, you know there's freedom to do it? Yeah, well, uh, good question. It's a big can word <laughs> there, right? So I'm gonna try and simplify uh, what, what the, the spirit of that question and, and answer from perspective. So it, the first part of that question is, is it easier for a, a, either a small company or a family owned business or a closely held company to really orchestrate all the attributes of that company Absolutely, yes, it's easier to do so. That doesn't make it easy per se, but it's much easier to have in that particular circumstances and environment to control what you can and to be intentional about what, what you want to uh, convey out into the world and to do that consistently. So, but the other side of the question, I wanna challenge it a little bit because yes, well, it's more difficult for a large publicly held company to orchestrate the complexity of, of you know, of integrity within a beautiful business, it still can be done. And so the, the business then has to really get clear on what its metrics are from an outcome standpoint. And I know if you're a publicly held company are driven primarily or partially by quarter to quarter results that, are, that result in profit. So, here I want to say something and I, I want to dispel like a myth that I hear about all the time. Well, if you're building a beautiful business, does that mean you're not going to make profit? And that is absolutely not the case. And I would actually make the argument that the more you create a beautiful business from the core that has integrity and integrated system, the more likely you are to attract consistent and loyal customers and consistent and loyal employees that move that business forward in a representative way that carries those values out into the world that makes much bigger and deeper impact. So, you know, like Harley Davidson is a great example of that. Publicly held company, been around forever, but they stay true to their core values and who they are, and they attract just the right people, and everyone else is not a Harley fan, and that's okay with them. They got plenty of people who love Harley Davidson motorcycles. And they grow and they grow and they grow and they make profit and they do an extraordinary job with that. So you know, the reality is that it can't be done on, on, on any, cent, any end of the equation on one end of the spectrum, but a small business or solopreneur or family owned business, absolutely a beautiful business can be employed there, but you can still certainly do it on the Fortune 100 companies and, and we're seeing it more and more these days. Yeah, lovely, lovely comments coming through from people just, just you know, Keep keep sharing your thoughts there, Renato. Playing, you know, wanting to make a positive difference in the world where we do business is one part of the mantra of BT. Um, and Chris has given his thoughts there, and a happy team is a productive, creative one. And Pradeep um, talking about every business is built by humans for humans. I think that's a really important point. I always remember when I first, um, my first week of joining 
um, as a graduate who uh, in the motor industry, uh, somebody was retiring. The sales director came to my desk and said to me, Chris, you're starting your career this week and I'm ending mine. Can I leave one message with you for, you know, for my, my career that I think is important? And I said, yeah, sure. He said, Chris, people are everything. And then he walked off and he's left that with me now for, you know, 20, 30 years or however long it's been. But that's really stuck in my mind and has impact what I what I do today. So I, I agree with you, Pradeep. So I know there's, there's three kind of um, principles within your work about a beautiful business, Steve, you know, belonging, integrity and magnetism. So let's let's talk about belonging, you know, mm -hmm. perhaps in the context of culture and marketing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so belonging is uh, now all of a sudden a word, uh, thanks to Brene Brown, that is in the zeitgeist of our of our uh, consciousness and awareness. And there's a lot of a wonderful dialogue around what belonging actually mean, means and how important it is. So in, in Brene's terminology, she would say the difference between fitting in and belonging is that fitting in is when you change yourself to feel like you're connected to the group. So you actually sacrifice a part of yourself in order to fit into the organization. And so in, in this context, they're gonna use the organization as the part that you're fitting in. On the other side of the spectrum is belonging. You show up as your wholehearted self, as your authentic, full human being. So the whole myth that check yourself at the door and you know don't bring your whole self to work, that's a myth. You know, by the way, any company who says that these days, they need to be challenged with that particular idea because I still see it happening. So belonging is when you bring your whole self into that environment and your value system is in some way, shape or form or some degree aligned with the value system that exists within that organization. And now because your values are aligned with their values, you have this connection of, of belonging, yeah. this bond of belonging, which yeah. goes very deep. When you think about, like, just for a moment, the collaborative work, the trust-oriented work, the innovative work, the ability to challenge one another and take the business further, when you have a shared set of values and belonging is in place, that becomes exponentially more powerful. Because here we are in the business world and collaboration is at its core. We have to collaborate. Again, it's, it's not just one individual to another individual unless you're a solopreneur only serving one client, it's human dynamics through and through. And so when we have belonging in that place, we have trust, we have aligned values, and the likelihood that we're gonna do much more exponential work together is certainly in place. And that's why I think belonging is so important. <clears throat> and and is, is belonging a, a way of describing in some ways or, uh, love? Is, is uh, creating something that people people love to be a part of and uh, and you, know, you say a, a sort of values level because that because that's important isn't it yeah yeah so you have uh, the greeks have uh, uh, i think there's six or seven versions or definitions of love uh, when we're talking about love typically in the work environment we're not talking about eros which is the passionate love and love affair type of, of love we're really talking talking about philia and agape so philia is the um, the connection between the, the version of brotherly love, if you know the city of Philadelphia, it's named after that, and it is called the city of brotherly love. And so this, there is this common bond that we're in this and to serve this entity uh, that we work together on, and we're going to work together through that aspect of love to make it as good as we can for that particular community. And then agape is the other version of love that I would apply in these particular situations, which has to do with the commonality of, of human attribute and the contribution that we all have in one another to uh, create a, a love-oriented connection through the belonging. So you really, in a way, you know, sometimes when I use the word love, some people like recoil back and say, well, what are we talking about? There's no, there shouldn't be love in the workplace. And, you know, I think it's an opportunity for a conversation of what kind of love are we talking about and what kind of passion are we talking about? Because when we, when we think, think, when we begin to think about uh, so the purpose of an organization, you have to have passion within that. Passion for the purpose is actually a version of love. So it's something I think it's really important to be talking about. And there's, uh, I do talk about it. It's not a whole chapter, but I do talk about it in my upcoming book on how important love is. 
Excellent. I, I think linking into that that feeling of be- belonging. I, I worked uh, about eight, a year ago now. I worked. I was working with a, a company for eighteen months. I think maybe start about to start again soon. But we one of the things was people weren't clear about the purpose. So worked for probably probably maybe it was in the back burner for nine months. I had little groups looking at purpose, and then one day the a statement linking all the, the the thoughts and feelings and what I'd seen in the DNA of the company came together in my mind and and I just shared it with the client uh, and not not really realizing that I'd made a kind of breakthrough until suddenly tears appeared in their eyes and they just went completely and utterly silent and I thought crikey I think we've got it here and then when we we shared it at a final day in front of all of the staff some of them them cried and there was a slight tweak to it um, but suddenly we knew we'd hit it because it was not only it didn't make sense from a head perspective it 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 seemed to hit a the mark from the heart yeah yeah and, yeah. and, and suddenly they all knew they all knew we were about caring caring for each other caring for our customers and our communities um, our employees our, our customers and uh suddenly it was like whoa you know we, we had this uh this this common bond a sense yeah, of belonging so, so important yeah and you know i've i've experienced that particular type of moment many many times and what tends, what I think tends to happen within that, I've had conversations with people after the fact, like what, tell me what you actually experienced there and what they experience say, and this is a summation of many stations in this realm, is the realization that it's all interconnected, that we are not just all interconnected within this organization, but we're all in this together to serve something that's greater than us. And, and what they're really experiencing there is a moment of awe a moment where you're sort of awestruck and you 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 can't feel that here it's not a it's not a it's not a conscious or strategic thought it's an emotional embodiment and it comes primarily from the heart center and then when people work from that heart center their exponential power is amplified into the work at hand and they also feel incredibly connected to everyone around them and this is an important point i know with, with your work and and mine too, particularly when I'm working on helping people understand their purpose. It's uh, uh, what is so important that the check for me is not that it logically makes sense. It's always that there's a there's a real, you know, heart connection to it. I'm asking people, you know, on a scale of one to ten, you know, how how is that you kind of thing? Is that your and, and if and if there's any any kind of you know, I know it's a six or a seven or an eight. There's more work to do until we get there. But when you crack it, it's uh, like ooh, you know, we've we've made it. So that's sort of there's a belonging there. So. Um, so I know. one point about that, it's really like, this is something I've been thinking about recently. So I'm going to probably stumble through this a little bit. I'm going to take it just for a moment out of the business context. I believe, and, and this is going to be very, I think, challenging for some people to, to really um, push against. But I believe we as a collective humanity, when we come to the realization that all of us are inextricably connected to one another and to all that is, yeah. we will immediately change the tools, the usage and the application of the tools and technology and the manner in which we communicate and even the manner in which we do business. So when that mindset shifts, or really it's a heart set shifts, and enough of us come to that realization, everything that came before that, that played the game we're all going to shift into this thing called the cooperative game and i think we're heading there we're not there yet but as a world culture the sooner we come to the awareness that we're all inextricably connected to both one another and all that is we will change the way we are i think that's i think that's such an important statement when we're actually we're all one and we really uh you know and uh, we're all having impacts on each other but you're right we can see realize that we're one kind of system that has an impact on everybody else that's that's um going to be so important maybe you know maybe i'm hoping that this covid situation you know has put a you know has, has made us press the reset button and uh, and you see signs of it don't you but only time will tell whether everybody really gets it it's a real shift in consciousness isn't it it really is yeah yeah and you take covid and you know we think you know, there's country borders and lines and things like that. And, you know, so we're safe from whatever company, country or we're safe even in the States from another state. Well, 
you know, COVID has proved otherwise, that that is not the case. And in a way, it's it's really demonstrated kind of in a scary way that we all are inextricably connected to one another. And so the behaviors of some affect the behaviors of others. And so it's perfect evidence in front of us to say, okay, well, let's look at the inter interconnection and let's honor that and let's treat that like vital and important. Yeah, yes. So and this is this a part of, I know for you, you say self-awareness is really important in leadership and culture. Is this a part of that awareness, a part of, a, you know, part of the, a shift in individual and collective consciousness to realize that, uh, uh, that, that we, we, we are impacted in a, in terms of being a system and if i do something unpleasant to you it actually hurts me as well as you if that makes yeah. sense it, yeah it, yeah so you know talking about self-awareness it's it's connected to that and i think it's the upstream version of getting to this awareness that we're all inextricably connected to one another so when i think about self-awareness i think about it from two different perspectives or angles and really maybe three so let's say i'm talking about myself and let's say that one version of the self-awareness is I am internally self-aware of what my belief systems are, what my values are, what my passions are, what my purpose is in life, and how I want to live my life. So that's the internal version of self-awareness. The other side of it, which is the versions of self-awareness, which is I have a, a deep level of awareness of how my actions, behaviors, and words affect those around me. So that's very different. And you can actually have a little bit of both or you can have one or the other. So you, we've seen people that they truly understand where their value system is. They're very passionate, but they have no clue on how they're affecting those around them. Yeah. So these are people that create chaos and things like that. You've seen them, right? Oh, or the other side of it, they're highly connected to their self-awareness of how they affect people around them, but they really don't understand what their value system is and what their beliefs are. And so they're going through life caring for other people, but they need to connect to the in internal self-awareness and that guidance system. So then if we extrapolate that out into the idea of we're all inextricably connected, the moment you understand the fusion of the self-awareness and you then practice that from a consciousness standpoint, then you begin to notice how other people are self-aware and where they're not self-aware and how we're connected to one another. So it takes a lot of work to get there and it is a bit of a leap, but it I believe self-awareness has to be in place in order to for individuals to really understand that we're all inextricably connected to one another. Yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking. a point from Charlotte Lee there. Oh, I've got a bit of an echo. Oh, about, about the point that people are everything. Oh. Oh, we've got another point here. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that, Charlotte. Can you hear me? Okay, Steve? I can, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's great. So I went, uh, I went, went a little bit of noise there, but I think Charlotte was also talking about the difficulty of getting this message about people uh, across and, uh, uh, and I think also agreeing with what you were, what you were sa saying there. It's, it, it is almost, I find in my work sometimes it's a bit like that, that it's the starfish on the beach. You just have to get one at a time to work with. There, there's some styles yeah. that really get people and there's some people who just don't. It's about, I, I always remember somebody once saying to me who was very left, uh, you know, left of lovely, lovely, lovely man, but very left and of, uh, and in terms of detail. And he said to me this, he said, Chris, he said, what, what is it that engages you about your work? And so oh, it's, um, it's people. He said, ah, those things that you use when you need them and you get rid of them when you don't. And this is a, he's a lovely man one-to-one -one and, 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 uh, but you know, he, he's, his focus is getting the task done. You know, that's the big, yeah. big one. And it, it, you know, it takes some work, doesn't it? So I, I'm just a bit mindful of also of time. Um, I want to talk about integrity. So you, we talked about belonging, um, integrity in a business system. So the second, that's the second, uh, Kind of principle around a beautiful business just a little bit about integrity and then we probably got um you know a couple of minutes as well to talk about magnetism before we need to to move yeah. over to rupert yeah yeah i've already touched on integrity a little bit uh because really it's the core tenant of what the beautiful business is all about and and again that is you know a holistic and wholehearted system that operates from the inside out and aligns its beliefs and behavior systems 
way it represents itself out into the world. So integrity is when everything is working together and there, everything is in alignment with one another. So when we are, when we as humans are integrated, we're actually whole. And so really the beautiful business is a whole business and it's, you know, this living entity that operates from the core out. And so, and, but it has to start with the, the clarity of understanding what our belief systems are, which is a version of organizational self-awareness. So uh, does the organization understand what it believes? Does the organization then understand through its behaviors how it affects the world around it? When it's conscious and intentional about those things, it has then integrity in place. Okay. Okay. And then let's, let's move on to magnetism. So, uh, so from this, this, um, this integrity in the organization, uh, and you and I have talked about magnetism before. Cause it's, and I think you've even interviewed me about it. I think on one uh, on one one occasion, because you know it's something I I, I feel very um, uh, is very important. Uh, magnetism it it attracts people in, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a it's a powerful attraction, and it's you know one of those elements that is certainly nature. And you know, it, it, the simplest way I can say it or do say it is that like likes like. And so things that have a common set of shared values, and there's the awareness of there's that common set of shared values, it draws people together. So magnetism can happen both from an employee standpoint. So uh, one of the customers I work with is sort of their employee journey and how they a- attract and, and onboard and then retain and employment staff, which they're, you know, this company is growing by leaps and bounds. And so they're very conscious of who they bring into their organization. And we've built a sort of a magnetism system that attracts the right people through their value set. And so when we do that, we can do that both from an employee standpoint and certainly from a customer standpoint. So when an organization is self-aware, clear about and clear and integrated about what it believes and consistent in the manner that it expresses itself even through product development and people understand what that value system is and what the benefits of that product or service are they are drawn to that organization there's a magnetism that comes to them and from a marketing standpoint it alleviates the need for organizations to chase customers because now they just have to make the invitation to enough of the right people and say here we are what we believe if you can get benefit from this then they're going to come to them they're going to come to them and they're going to not just come to them but in the magnetic world they're going to stick together and stay bonded yeah so, so I'm, I'm i'm you know i'm listening to this and i always love our our conversations and you, you have a, a beautiful artistic way of eloquently sharing uh, ideas and thoughts and concepts how do you practically make all this happen oh Big goodness problem. yeah well, it's, that's the hard part. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, again, the, the work that I do for organizations is, uh, you know, the, the continuum that has to happen is you have to start with the leadership team and really get into helping them remove anything that doesn't matter. I call them obstacles, the things that are in the way that either create chaos or confusion and get into the heart and soul of what the business is all about. And that starts with the belief systems. And I, you know, I call that purpose. I call that vision. I call that a promise, which is an outward facing purpose. And then the core values, which are the operating system within the business. And so the workshop that I'm giving today is is the first start of that for this particular company. And it will be working with the core senior leadership team to define what their value system is all about, starting with purpose. And then that leadership team, we together articulate those things. And honestly, Chris, what I play is really midwife. Like I don't invent these things and say, I think your purpose should be this. It should come from them. It's frankly, it's already there and it probably already exists there. They're just not aware of it. And so my job is moving everything else out of the way and allowing that, that system to be birthed. So once it's done with the leadership team, we infuse it within the culture, roll it, activate it within the culture. And then once that's activated, we then turn that out to an outward expression to the world, uh, which could be stakeholders, it could be community, it could be customers, it could be done through marketing, or it could be done through rebuilding the actual brand aesthetic or brand expression to represent 
those belief systems. And so that's the, the very short crib notes version of the process or journey that I would walk people through. And, you know, that journey could take, you know, anywhere from six months to a year. And if it's culture work, then it, depending on the complexity of the culture, it could take even longer. Yeah. So, yes, I think that's a good, a good, uh, I thought there, well, I just thought we're there with you being a midwife and, uh, and giving, giving, <laughs> giving, 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 help them give birth to an idea. And then, you know, you, you may imagine you a little bit like my example. We, we, we did that. We, we did that. And they were still struggling to land on it. And it finally took, uh, you know, uh, me spending hours kind of just in the back of my subconscious working on it when finally I was able to, to bring it to them and say, I think we've got, uh, there's, have we got a boy here or a girl, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting. <laughs> Life metaphor works. It tends to work fairly well because there's like you know breathing exercises that have to happen because we're giving yeah. birth and there's a lot of like pain and transition and struggle. Like you know, okay, let's calm down, let's breathe through this and all that kind of thing. So uh, there is a bit of that. There is a bit of that. So for frustration and pain, often precedes clarity, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And in in, in the creative world destruction is actually required for the creative process to become a new wow. it's like one of the phases within we have to get rid of the old we have to tear down some barriers we have to remove some obstacles so that there's space for the new things to come in and be born excellent well i'm, I'm uh, looking forward to reflecting on this with what i do and and i hope you know, people here too are with their work think how can you um you know get, connect and use belonging uh, and integrity and magnetism to attract in customers and build a, you know, a beautiful way of doing business with uh, the way that you operate. So I'm going to ask Rupert to join us now because uh, Rupert will be sitting there in the background. He'll be desperate to ask some questions as well. I'm sure. Uh, yeah. Any, any yeah. I mean, it's it's been really interesting all of this. I think there's one part which um, I'm not sure I've actually missed it or whether it's something we haven't covered yet. But I think your last point you made here is about the spiral of evolution is the arch of a healthy business. Have we covered that or have I missed something? Um, I'm not sure we have. Isn't that a one we, uh... we didn't touch on that, but you know, it's interesting. I think part of the reason that that's a particularly important note is that you know, when we think about, so you know, I use the word or the term evolution quite often. And you know, part of that is you know, leaning into the work of Darwin and uh, really understanding you know, sort of the study of how um, species evolve. And you know, so he would say, you know, sometimes a lot of people either misunderstand or misquote Darwin, and they think it's all about the survival of the fittest, which is actually not what his point is at all. Um, uh, I think in one of his books, uh, I forget which one it was, but he actually referenced the word love like 60 times throughout the book. And you know, so really his, his mindset was, and I believe this because, you know, we, we've seen it over and over again, is that when entities, species and organizations utilize tools that have to do more with uh, cooperation and working with other people in adaption to the world environments and the realities that we're facing, the, the more likely they are to evolve. But the situation is that we never just evolve once. And we all know this from our own human journey. So the person that we are when we were 10 years old, when we were 20 years old, 30 years old, while there's natural growth that comes from that, but there's also evolutions of awareness that happens. So really, I like to think about it less as a either a linear line or less as a I'm, I'm climbing a ladder, but more so I'm spiraling around my core belief systems and I'm coming closer and closer to a pointed system that makes for more effective work at, at the higher that spiral spiraling effect so you know you think about evolution it is not just a state but it's a journey and it's a journey of becoming much more ever whole and much more of ourselves along within that process and you know within the book there'll be little graphics that talk about the difference between you know a a non-spiraled version of evolution or a spiraled version of evolution. And one just little thought exercise that is, might be helpful for people there is you think about a spiral, if you look at a spiral from the top down, it just looks like a wheel that spins out, if, if you will. 
Or you can turn that spiral on its side or look at it from the side view, and it starts with a wide element and then gets finer and finer and finer around a center that we're all orbiting, which is belief systems or purpose in life. Lovely. That's really nice. I love that. It's so powerful as well. So I uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, we will be coming back to one just in a few minutes, but I'll just do a little bit of a recap as part of the next session. And also, uh, Steve, I think you've got something to share about your book coming up as well, haven't you, which we'll talk about in a moment or two. Uh, but just a quick uh, recap um, for everyone else here today. Um, obviously, every Thursday uh, since March, middle of March, this year, the beginning of COVID, um, uh, with Chris and I got together and decided that we ought to run, we, we would love to run this live stream every week. Uh, uh, thanks to Chris for buying into that vision to right at the very beginning. Um, we preceded this now by online networking collaboration, and a number of you on the call today were actually part of the earlier session. Uh, so thank you very much for taking part on that. When you actually book each week now, we've actually, as you know, simplified it so you can just book one flexi ticket and attend both. Um, Chris, I know you were, have introduced uh, Elizabeth, uh, which I'm really fascinated about. Did you want to just uh, briefly talk through these points that uh, Elizabeth is going to cover next week in um, preparation? Yeah, sure. Elizabeth is, um, well, Steve's met Elizabeth, haven't you, through uh, yeah. our, our sort of conversation. So Elizabeth is a, a fascinating leadership, multiple author, uh, expert um, around impact and, and various different elements. So we talked about, uh, when I had chatted with her last, last couple of weeks ago, actually, we chatted about psychological safety and about uh, this, this, this notion of people feeling quite, quite uncomfortable right now with with covid and you know in a in, in a place of uncomfortable whether they've got jobs if they're on furlough and uncomfortable where they're safe when they get back into the workspace you know feeling uncomfortable when it comes to covid so uh, we were chatting this this idea through and we thought it'd be a really good conversation to think about you know what what does it mean and why is it particularly important at the moment and uh, and about the in, in emotional intelligence companies need to take and individuals need to take to create uh, environments where people do feel safe, where they feel safe, maybe coming back into an office, uh, and uh, I think it's something we need to really think about as leaders. So, um, Elizabeth is, uh, is a fascinating individual. She's from Stockholm in in Sweden, but lives down in the UK at the moment. And I'm sure it's be another another great conversation next week. So I'm looking forward to that one too. Lovely, and thank you very much, Chris. So much, be a good session. Um, and uh, just a quick reminder for those of you on the third week of. Uh, uh, September, so for starting 21st September, we've got a three-day mini conference. Um, each session is 90 minutes long, and we're going to be talking about uh, those three points listed there. Um, obviously, in there, you'll sort of see reference to building your tribes, uh, which I think ties in really well with what uh, Stephen's talked about uh, and shared today, and um, also about building ultimately what really is a social business as well, where we're driven by a real sense of social purpose as well. For me, that's a uh, very powerful. Um, we will be having a fantastic prize as part of a three-day session. Uh, Stuart Honey won it before. I know we've got Nikki in this call today, and she was the runner-up last time, but got a £100 prize instead. Um, but so, Nikki, you, you never know. Might be lucky this time. There will be different questions, uh, but uh, you know, do feel free. You can join in on that. And the way you can access that is very simply, or both today and next, uh, the 21st of September, is by going to the events drop down on the website businessgrowthbureau.com, choosing the events drop down, and choosing to register for the flexi ticket for today's sessions. Um, and do feel free to join in for one or both. Uh, very keen for you to join us. And the other parts where you can book the um, uh, the uh, mini conference. Uh, and obviously, we're here to support you on your journey. Um, we don't want you to ever feel alone. Um, running a business can be pretty tough. And uh, we are here to support you through that growth. So you can set a reminder as well through Facebook. And if you're on YouTube, then do hit that bell. Um, and also feel you can share with your network as well. Uh, we obviously love you taking part. Uh, these are the contact details for uh, Stephen, myself, and Chris. And uh, so do reach out if you uh, would like to do so. And um, I think a few other people made a few comments as well. But Stephen, did you want to use this a little bit of an opportunity to touch on your uh, book as well and what you're going to be covering uh, as part of that? Would that be a good opportunity for you to share some insights? 
Oh, sure. Yeah. Most of this conversation was about uh, the, some of the contents within the book, and uh, which is called The Beautiful Business. It'll be out early next year. Uh, the publisher is Conscious Capitalism which is uh, a global organization, nonprofit organization that really, uh, you know, feeds into a lot of the purpose oriented work that I do. And it's a beautiful collaboration between that particular company. So the beautiful business really is going to be a, a hands on guide. It's part manifesto, but part actionable manifesto into how you or anyone uh, that you work with can go about to uh, uh, thinking through creating and uh, implementing your own beautiful business. Lovely. No, that's that's really good. Um, we've also asked a question by here, Pradeep here. Um, I don't know if we've got any thoughts on um, uh, on that particular uh, question that Pradeep's asked there. Uh, any particular comments or thoughts on that one? So the, the question, uh, I'll just read it to uh, yeah. Steve from, from where do you tap into your spiritual and psychological outlook? So uh, beautiful question. Thank you for that. I, um, the spiritual outlook, I am non-denominational or non-religious, if, if you will. I was raised Catholic, but uh, really migrated away from uh, any organized religion. I've studied uh, Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, uh, and a wide variety of other uh, spiritual attributes. But a lot of it has to do with um, both meditation and then communing with nature. So, you know, meditation can sometimes be seen as prayer, uh, but the difference between meditation and prayer is prayer is typically an ask uh, of the the powers that be, the, 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 the all that is, and meditation is uh, simply a listening exercise of trying to tune into your higher self and the guidance that might come from that. So. You know, daily meditations twice a day for years and years and years, and uh, occasionally, at least once a year, I go along a silent meditation retreat, and uh, uh, sometimes that's done through a backpacking trip, or sometimes that's done through, you know, an or some type of retreat event. And then the psychological work uh, is still fascinating to me, um, primarily focused on the work of Carl Jung and uh, his uh, map of the soul and work is uh, quite academic and quite dense, but I, uh, he has been phenomenally uh, influential, uh, influential to me because of his work in integrating everything from persona and character and even uh, archetypes, which I work with in my, uh, my, some of my brand work, helping organizations identify their own uh, brand archetype, if you will, and then express that out to the character. And then the work of Abraham Maslow and his hierarchy of needs is uh, especially the element of transcendence. Transcendence is utterly important to my work. And uh, a lot of that's covered in the up upcoming book as well, just uh, how that influences me. And then just sort of tangential to that uh, is the work of Joseph Campbell, who was a close friend with Carl Jung. And he then took and, you know, uh, took the archetypal work and stories and especially as we all know the hero's journey and map that into uh into his world and so i apply some of that into the hero's journey of a business which again if we go back to the spiral evolution uh in a way that's uh, an organization's own hero's journey and that we're constantly coming back home to ourselves and with new realizations new gifts new offerings and new ways of seeing the world wow no, lovely. I, I've got a question I've been dying to ask you. I've been trying to pluck up the courage because I don't want to enter the political arena. Uh, by any chance. I'll but, bring it up. Why not? Yeah, it, it seems to me we're in, especially in the US, it's become very tribal, um, yeah. a lot of the political arena. How do you feel that this is playing out to business and how can you make sure that the energy that's being applied is a positive form of energy, not at the opposite form of energy, which seems to be curated, being created at the moment. Um, how can we turn this very negative campaigning effectively into something that's really positive and beautiful? So we're all working closely in the workplace, but also with clients and our, our supporters and everything else around that. Yeah, th this this is like a whole show topic potentially on its own. You know, so that the you know what is the relationship between the division between political perspectives, which are also sociological divisions, uh, even borderlining on 
and I use this word very loosely, uh, civil war or combatant uh, uh, one ideology against another. Um, you know, the interesting thing is, is, is we think about that particular consideration, Rupert, and how it might show up into the workplace. I'm actually not seeing a lot of that. It seems like people, for the most part, and I know this is not true across the board, but at least in the circles that I'm traveling in, somehow are figuring out how to segregate their political beliefs and leave them out of the office environment. And a lot of that has to do with the leaders creating boundaries around what is and is not okay to really bring into this and what's relevant to the business. So we could ask ourselves the question, is it relevant to talk about politics in the business environment if, if that's not what the work is at hand? And so unless you're a political consultant, obviously that's a very different kind of equation. Or, you know, let's say you're a lobbyist. That's a very different consideration. But if you're a consumer products company or a B2B business that offers services and software or something like that, the, the leaders have to ask themselves, well, what's the relevance of a political dialogue in, in this particular equation? And, you know, the likelihood is very low that it's going to be high on the relevant scale. And so what I'm seeing for the most part is that that divisiveness is being left out of most corporations. Uh, although, you know, it's there's some interesting things that are beginning to happen. So um, a tangential element to um, the political divide is the Black Lives Matter movement, which I know is a global movement. And I was particularly struck by an organization called Ben and Jerry's, which is a famous ice cream maker and has a lot of social causes, how they very, very, very strongly came out and, and were very clear about, here's what we believe. And they publicized that. And they were both applauded and lauded for that. Now, mostly it was applaud for their courage in saying, from a belief system and leadership perspective, here's what our business and brand believes, and we support this. And they were very clear about their public pro proclamation. Now, I know that's not directly political, but it's where an organization can get very clear and publicly loud about their belief systems, where it, the converse of that was a lot of other organizations where the CEOs came out and had a softer sort of more, um, uh, nebulous version of what their belief system was. And some of those organizations took some criticism for that. Right, right. So, 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 I've found that, 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 that very interesting in, uh, in many ways, actually, because my concern has been is that some of this could be starting to filter into the workplace and causing out all sorts of other issues. So it's nice that uh, businesses, in particular, or CEOs of companies, are choosing to take a much softer inclusive approach um so that that has reassured me a lot so thank you very much for that um stephen really a great session thank you very much and uh, chris have you got any sort of clothing thoughts or comments uh you'd like to see an awesome mural as well in terms of today well i think uh, i always always enjoy talking with stephen and uh, and i think he what i like about him is, is not only that he has lots of you know, great, um, great ideas and perspectives and thoughts is, is this groundedness, which uh, always reminds me around the disciplines of sort of regular daily sort of meditation and practice. So um, I, I I'd also sort of add to that list of Carl Jung and all those sorts of people, too. I, I've become very into a, a guy called Thomas Campbell, who wrote The Big Theory of Everything. And you can check that out. And uh, and he's a, he's a physicist, worked with NASA uh, and uh, built uh, high-tech defense systems in the U.S., but he's also for 45 years been looking at the whole realm of consciousness and uh, scientifically looking at that and the reality. Uh, and I had the privilege last Friday to to interview him. It was a real, real honor, and it was a, an amazing, amazing experience. So again, if you have the chance to check out on the show that interview, I would really, it's, it, it's, it's very thought-provoking. We've got a, a second, a second one coming up as well, but but his work is shaping quite a bit of my thinking at the moment too. Um, so I'd, I'd add that to the list, but Stephen, thank you. It's, it's always a, it's always a pleasure. Lovely. Thank you. Mira, any closing thoughts from you? Yeah, uh, that was absolutely, absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Stephen. You've got this wonderful calmness about you. It's infectious. You, you really do. What I would like is just to ask you a very quick question. Um, you've obviously got a fantastic life work balance. Um, what with your surfing and your painting and your cycling 
and your motorbiking, motorbiking, your meditation, when do you actually find time to work? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's, uh, I actually work a lot. It's, it's kind of weird. Uh, my, my wife would say he's like, he was working all the time, but that's obviously not the case. I, I am an early riser. I've been an early riser for forever. I get up around five in the morning and mm. the first uh, yeah, hour and a half, two hours of my day are, are you know, private time, meditative time, spiritual time, journaling time, and conversations with my wife, which we sit out back. But I'm at my desk at around seven, and I quarantine the early parts of my morning. I don't book any meetings except for things like this uh, until about 11 o'clock. And it's from 11 o'clock on that I can you know, take meetings and do phone calls or Zoom calls or run workshops and that kind of thing. Now, you know, I obviously bend the rules on that when, you know, I run an all day workshop or have to travel for events and that kind of thing. But it's that that private time that allows me to be centered and enter my day in the way that I think benefits both me and the people that I serve. And then, you know, I'm usually done working by, you know, 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon and I go play. And, you know, I'll go for a cycle or a surf or whatever. And, um, you know, my weekends are full with painting and uh, tending to the bees and, and uh, cycling or whatever. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. Rupert, don't forget, three o'clock tomorrow, I'm going to play. I'm not available. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Rupert, I'll see you at 5.30 then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Make sure I ring you at five in the morning, Mira, or somewhere. That's fine. <laughs> to be awake and probably answer the call. Uh, but, uh, Stephen, thank you very much, Steve. Chris. Obviously, uh, thank you for introducing Stephen today. Thoroughly enjoyable. What? Lastly, quick question, what's the name of your new book going to be called? Oh, the beautiful business. Ah, oh, lovely. Thank you very much. It's got to be, of course, isn't it? When is it going to be available? Uh, we're, we're trying to nail down the date. It should be Q1 of uh, 2021. Uh, okay. And, you know, it's interesting with COVID, I pushed it back. So when not only we have COVID, but we have like this, I don't know if anyone's heard, we've got an election coming up here in the United States that <laughs> seems to be kind of a big one. Uh, and I didn't want to compete with any of the noise that was out there and trying to promote a new book when, you know, the world was going to wherever they were going to. And so uh, Q1 of next year is when it will come out. I, I, it'll probably most likely be in the February time frame. Lovely. Yeah, that sounds, sounds fantastic. Um, if there's any constellations, just while you didn't issue your book today, because in the UK, 500 books have been published today. Is that right, Chris? I got into that. That's to me. Over 500 books published today uh, yeah. in the UK. Uh, yeah, so I think it must have all been saved up. <laughs> <laughs> Big splash. But uh, anyway, you'll probably get the onslaught in the US sometime soon from us Brits. So, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wonder if these are, are COVID books, books that yeah. are COVID and now they're ready. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but uh, anyway, thanks so much, everyone, for joining us today. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, and obviously, lovely mural. And thank you for joining us. See you all next week. Yeah, take care. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>